All right, so thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining us today for our uh, an int introduction to anti-racism training. Um, I will pass off the mic to um, the Elmwood team, but first, I'll just do a, a quick introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Jessica Prasnick. I'm one, I'm one of the project managers at Immigration Partnership Winnipeg. Um, Im immigration Partnership Winnipeg is a local immigration partnership. And we're really dedicated to making Winnipeg um, a more welcoming, inclusive city, not only for newcomers, but all Winnipeggers. And I'd like to be begin today um, by acknowledging that us organizers of this training are located on Treaty 1 territory. This is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Ojibwe Cree, and Dene people, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. What that means to me is that I'm, I'm very grateful to be, have this opportunity to work on this land, especially as we discuss racism in this training and in our community, we must understand, recognize, and address the historical and ongoing impact of colonization. So I just want to start with a bit of um, Zoom webinar etiquette. And um, so if you have questions, there is, um, I believe there should be a Q&A section. Um, so you can submit your questions through that um, Q&A uh, box. Um, and there is also a chat box. So you, you're welcome to put some information in there. But this training is a safe space. So if we find any um, racist or discriminatory comments, um, we will take them down and um, you will be asked to, to leave as we do want to ensure that this training continues to be safe for everybody who's attending. Um, I just want to give a big thank you to uh, Becky Lake from Manso who's helping us right now manage all of the chat questions. I see a bunch of comments coming up. So thank you so much, Becky. Uh, we're all really thank you. We're all really thank you here from um, the team putting on this, this training. Um, and I want to thank you for your help with the technical support. So before we get into our training, I just wanted to introduce our speakers today. You just give me one second. Sorry, everyone. All right. So, and, and I really want to start by saying that this training has been um, all of the, 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 I guess I want to start by giving a big thank you to the Elmwood team. This training has really been put on by them. They've done all of the hard work, um, all of the information sharing is coming from them, and they're just a fantastic group of, of folks. So all of the thanks really goes to them. So we have three speakers from um, Elmwood Community Resource Center who will be um, doing the training today. So Nina Kondo is a Black Canadian, a mother of two boys. Her background is mental health and social work. She's the executive director of Elmwood Community Resource Center. Under Nina's leadership, the ECRC has received many awards in recognition of its work in the community. Most recently, a public recognition by the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba. Nina serves as the board of directors for the Manitoba Association of Newcomer Serving Organizations, the Chalmers Neighborhood Renewal Corporation, as well as a chair of the inclusion and civic engagement sector table for Immigration Partnership Winnipeg. She, she's serving on the national gender-based violence strategy, representing the Canadian Immigrant Settlement Sector Association and MANSO, an initiative of um, Immigration Refugee Citizenship Canada. Nina is passionate about community development, advocacy, and empowering individual families. Her philosophy is it takes a community to build, raise, and heal families while supporting the growth liberation for everyone. Then we have Laura Barker. She is a registered social worker who's been working with individuals and families facing a variety of challenges since 2011. She uses a multi-model and strength-based approach to empowering clients towards health and well-being. Lauren has received her Bachelor of Social Work from the University of Calgary and is currently in the process of obtaining her Master's of Social Work degree from the University of Manitoba. Lauren has extensive experience in, field of, in the field of crisis intervention and is currently managing the Women's Awakening Program at Elmwood Community Resource Center, where, where she provides group and individual counseling to individuals who struggle with trauma and domestic violence. Lauren believes that wisdom, growth, and healing emerge when 
individuals are provided with a safe and affirming relationship in which to explore personal challenges. The third speaker we have is Tamika. She's a registered social worker from the University of Manitoba. She currently works at Elmwood Community Resource Center as a community research and outreach coordinator. Sorry. Within this position, Tamika is the first point of contact for many counseling requests as she conducts the intakes. She also focuses on research and developing best practices approach to topics such as anti-racism and inclusivity within the Elmwood Community Resource Center. So thank you so much to our wonderful speakers, and I will pass it off to them. Hey, Jess and Nina, it's Becky. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if we can just add one more thing to the logistics. I've had a few questions from people about whether there uh, is a plan to share the recording after the webinar. Um, and then maybe also if um, you'd like people to use um, just the Q&A function, or if you want people to be able to raise their hands as well. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, sorry, I should have, uh, both details I should have provided. So I really apologize for that. Uh, we are currently recording the, the webinar and we will share, uh, we'll share the webinar after the training. We'll just have to, it'll go up on both of our websites. So Immigration Partnership Winnipeg and Elwood Community Resource uh, Center, likely shared through YouTube. Um, so yeah, keep an eye on for that because I know some people have to leave early. So please do look out for that. Um, as well, if you could submit your questions to the Q&A box, we will, the training, we're anticipating for it to go from now until seven, and then we've allocated about a half an hour at the end to answer all your questions. So we're going to go straight through with the training, and then at the end, we'll plan to answer those questions. So please submit all of your questions through the Q&A box, um, and then we will get to it at the end of the training. And if we don't have time in that half an hour to answer all of your questions, we will um, incorporate trying to answer them in our second part of this training, which is on June 25th, how to be um, an effect, being an effective ally. So um, please, yeah, please feel free to put your questions in the, the Q&A. Thank you so much, Becky. So I'm gonna pass on the, the baton to the Elmwood team. Hello everybody, I'm Nina. I'm the Executive Director of Elmwood Community Resource Center and I welcome to the anti-racism training. Um, this is going to be a thought-provoking training, but also um, we, I will ask people to sit with the uncomfortableness and um, some of the topic that we're, some of the topic that we're discussing will bring up some some wonders and um, if you can reflect on it and um, and then at the end we'll be asking you some poll question and some call to action as well. Um, so Elmwood Community Resource Center is a nonprofit organization located in Elmwood. Um, it's been around since 2001. Uh, we do offer services for families, so children, youth and adults, and that include counseling program to adult literacy to employment programming, um, as well as indigenous parenting program and newcomer program as well as um, recreation activity program and summer programming. So we are we offer um, around 10 to 15 programming um, constant, consistently and concurrently. Um, so I invite you to go to our website and learn more about the services that we do. But also we do all the work in partnership with all of you. Um, we have amazing part local partner here in Elmwood. And as well as I want to acknowledge uh, Jessica for doing all the work uh, behind the scene and for bringing all of us here together and as well as Becky from Manso um, for helping us with the technical <laughs> challenges that we were having before. And I wanna acknowledge my team as well, Tamika and Lauren who have done uh, the legwork of putting this training together, um, but also acknowledging how emotional impacting and draining that this training is also causing not only on the participant but also on the um, speakers themselves. Thank you. So I'll pass on to Jessica. All right, are we ready for the first poll? Is that the yes. plan? Okay, perfect. Okay, great. 
All right, everyone. So we're going to um, have a little bit of interaction here. Uh, we're going to launch our first poll. We'll give you about a minute or two to respond. And we just want to get to know who we have here in the webinar. So there should be um, a box that pops up that everybody uh, can then vote on uh, where you're from and how old are you or how old you are. All right. OK, so I'll uh, share the results with everyone. Uh, yeah, so as everyone can see, uh, so most people are from Winnipeg, um, but interesting enough, we have uh, some people from outside of Winnipeg in Manitoba, which is awesome. Shout out to everybody uh, who's out there from outside of Winnipeg. Also really interesting, and now we have some people in Canada, but not Manitoba, and we have 4% of people that aren't in Canada at all, so that's really interesting. If you're not in Canada, can you write in the chat box where you're from? And uh, in regards to how old participants are, so um, the major group is between 25 and 34, but in a close second is uh, 35 to 44 year old, and um, a couple of people under 24, and a couple of people between 45 and 54. So awesome, happy to have you all here. All right. And Nina, do we have a we had a second poll that we wanted to launch now, right? Okay, the, so the second poll we wanted to um, launch was to get an understanding of why you wanted to participate today. So what's your, what's your motivation? So we'll just give, uh, we'll give another minute for that. All right, so we'll end that, share the results with everyone. So it looks like uh, both uh, people are attending this webinar for, for more education and for personal understanding as well as some other um, are attending for work-related, so 10% and 4% um, uh, for other. So thank you so much for um, participating in those polls. Okay. So um, I'll start by talking about what is race. Thank you for those of you who answered through our poll. Um, is everybody can see this, the, this slide share, the PowerPoint? There we go. All right, so what is race? Um, race is a social con construct um, and it was created by human in certain historical and, and material condition. Um, it's used to represent a world in, in certain ways under certain historical condition for certain political interest. Um, but also it's, um, it, it's social contracts because it implies that it can vary, it can change, it's very fluid. Um, Robert Mile defined race as an idea created by human being um, that you usually is to understand the differences that we have. Um, um, race is used in in specific or historical context in which it operates, but also um, it highlights that it's important not to assume that race is um, inheritant category that we have always existed, that we've always um, exist and do not change but how racial groups are defined and, and mixed into one group is also another problematic about. Um, race is a scientific biological notion used to categorize people according to the, uh, their, their characteristic. Um, their historical grouped a wide range of people according to their region, religion, class, uh, skin color. Um, although the idea of race um, predates scientific involvement, science help us in casting division in appearance, um, as, as indicated um, in terms of your attribute. Um, but it was until the 1990, 1999 um, to 1938 that the biological validity of race is, um, is being accepted as a concept, um, but then it became to, to disappear um, it became to disappear with new scientific circle where it's used as a race is a typology to explain culture phenomenal, um, but was largely rejected as well. So 
that's race. Um, and then the next, the next slide will be, will take us to what is racism? Um, so I'll just leave that, that slide on for a few minutes for you to ponder, contemplate. And ask yourself where racism starts. Um, how do we become racist? Um, so Do Dorothy and Wendy define racism to be the product of racial attitude and belief that are endured through social life. Um, like race, racism is also a social construct phenomenal. Um, race is a social construct phenomenon uh, where we attribute each other based on the characteristics that we possess, uh, whether that's a skin color or physical um, attributes, uh, facial feature, hair color, texture, um, all of that, intellectual ability, um, sometimes our moral and, and sometimes culture as well. So racism can occur on, on all level of our society and also throughout our social interaction. So racism can happen from an individual being spontaneously singled out um, for discriminatory treatment, whether that can be refusal of access to opportunities. Um, it's a social practice connected to power and it's also used to categorize others. Um, there are four types of racism and we'll go into it later on. And then we'll go into the next slide. I think we also are gonna do a poll for experience of racism and their understanding. Thank you. All right, so I'll launch the first one about, um, we were just wanting to know your experience with racism. All right, so I'll end the poll and share the results. So the, the two questions were, the first was, have you personally experienced racism? Um, and so about 60% of the people that are watching this web, webinar said no, while 33% yes, said yes, and seven, I don't know. Uh, the second question, have you personally witnessed somebody experiencing racism? And 88% said yes, 5% said no, and 7% said I don't know. Okay, and I believe we have another poll for this one on the motivation or sorry, level of understanding. Yes. Okay. Okay, one more poll. <laughs> so we'll give you another uh, minute and a minute and a bit to answer. All right, so we'll end the poll and uh, share the results. And Nina, do you want to go over the results? Yeah. So what is, uh, we have 1% with uh, that they feel they have no understanding about racism. We have 6% who have a little bit of understanding about racism and 58% who feel somewhat that they have an understanding about racism, but have a lot more to learn. And then 33% who have a, quite a bit of an understanding of what is racism, but want to and then we have 2% who feel that they are expert in racism matter. Thank you all for, for, for responding to the poll. Um, so we'll move on to our next slide. Um, thank you. So the next slide it talks about power, the power of, of invisibility. White uh, as a non-race is most evident in the absence of reference to whiteness in the speech that we give, in the academic writing that we have. Um, we also find that white will speak of uh, the blackness, the brownness um, of their friends, neighbors, colleague, client, um, and it will be in a most gen genuinely and friendly way but still racialized people don't have the same power or the same ability to mention the whiteness of the folks they know. Um, so being human, just that the, the fact of being human, there's no, there's, more, there's no more powerful position than just 
being that position. Um, so Richard Dyer, I've been referencing some of the material of where you can also learn um, these topics a little bit further. Um, so the claim to power is the claim to speak for the commonality of humanity. Raced people don't have that power. They can only speak from a place of their race, from a place of their own experiences, but non race people can for they do not represent the interests of a race. Um, as such, whiteness can be weaponized. For instance, we've heard it recently, Amy Cooper, who um, have called the police on a black male uh, who wanted just to protect a bird uh, that he was mostly wanting Amy to leash their, her dog. Um, so that whiteness can be weaponized in a, in a negative way, but also it can be used as a powerful way to drive change, change that will be positively um, impacting everyone. So to the next uh, slide, it, it goes on to talk about white privilege. Um, White privilege is defined as unquestionable or unearned set of benefit, entitlement, and choices bestowed upon people just because they are white. Based um, generally, white people will experience that privilege without being really conscious of it. Um, so, for example, I can go shopping alone most of the time and be sure that I will not be followed in the store. That can be a white person speaking. But me as a black female, I cannot go in a shop and be 100% sure and safe that no one will follow me around. Um, another privilege that white people may hold is um, I can go from most meeting of organization that I belong to I, and feel somewhat tied into rather than isolated or out of place and also feeling heard versus um, in some of the occasion where I will be invited to attend a meeting. Um, but when I'm speaking out and sharing my perspective, my voice may not be heard. My voice will be, oh, okay, but not taken into consideration. But when I ask my my colleague, Lauren, to speak the same message that I'm, I've passed on, that message will be accepted hearing it from Lauren. So some of those things that we do unconsciously, we need to start looking into it and, and stopping those behavior. Okay, the next one, I uh, will pass on to Tamika, who will take us into a little bit of history and the root cause of race, uh, racism. Okay, so there's an idea that Canada, um, racism doesn't exist in Canada, but historically and currently it does. So I'm just gonna go over a few of the um, racist events and race um, colonism that happened in Canada historically. So in the 1600s, the first European colonists in Canada. In 1619, the first shipload of enslaved Africans to reach British North America landed at Jamestown. From 1628 until 1800, 1800s, 3,000 people of African ancestry were in, who were enslaved in the United States were brought to Canada and forced to live here in slavery. In 1776, Black loyalists arrived. The British promised freedom rights to slaves and free black people in exchange for service during the American Revolution. During this time, Canada developed a reputation as a safe haven for black Americans. In 1833, slavery was abolished throughout the British colonies by an imperial act which became effective. The right to vote in provincial and municipal elections was taken away from Chinese Canadians in British Columbia. Japanese Canadians and South Asians were similarly disenfranchised in 1895 and 1907, respectively. In 1876, the Indian Act was created. In 1880, the amendment to the Indian Act formally disenfranchised and disempowered Indigenous women. In 1884, um, Indigenous ceremonies were banned by the federal government.
1914, 376 people from India were detained from a ship for two months and then and then denied entry into Canada. Ontario barred Chinese males from hiring white females. In 1920, the Dominion Elections Act effectively extended the Deputy Superintendent General of Indian Affairs, Duncan Campbell Scott, makes attendance at residential school mandatory for every Indigenous child. In 1922, the KKK and other white nationalists became active forces in Canada. In 1921, in 1929, Saskatchewan passed a law which forbade any white woman or girl from working in any restaurant, laundry, or other place of business owned by any Japanese or other oriental person. In 1942, the Canadian government ordered all persons of Japanese racial origin to be removed from the restricted zone within 100 miles of the west coast of British Columbia. The Canadian government forced 20,000 Japanese people into the internment camps. In 1953, as a part of the Southern, as a Northern sovereignty agenda, the federal government forced Settlement of eight Inuit families to the northernmost settlement in Canada on Ellesmere Island. And these are just the last few. Um, in 1960, as residential schools closed, thousands of Indigenous children were taken from their families by provincial and federal social workers and placed in foster or adoption homes. In 1983, the last segregated school in Canada was in Nova Scotia, and in 1996, the last residential school was closed. So that's just an idea of the historic racism that has gone, that has happened and occurred in Canada. Now I'm going to speak to the four dimensions of racism. So there's the internalized uh, racism, there's interpersonal, there's systematic, and there's institutional. And systematic and institutional kind of relate. So inter internalized racism, it's a form of internalized oppression fueled by the endurance of everyday racism. Overt and covert racist messages or events that create negative beliefs and self-hatred in individuals. Internalized racism is a self-fulfilling prophecy that tells individuals they are not good enough while negatively impacting their physical and mental well-being. So uh, the next is interpersonal racism. This kind of racism can be seen through personal attacks on racialized groups with the use of derogatory slurs, stereotypes, name calling, physical abuse, um, et cetera. Interpersonal racism sometimes isn't as obvious for it can be portrayed through microaggressions or thoughts. So now I'm gonna go over microaggressions. Microaggressions are subtle expressions of racism that seem harmless but can cause great offense to the microaggressed. Microaggressions can be intentional or intentional. They are coded with negative messages and stereotypes that portray the dominant group as the standard and other groups as abnormal. So I'm just gonna to go to the next slide with the examples. Okay. So these are just a few examples of different microaggressions. Um, number one is, where are you really from? This implies that you're not Canadian and you must be foreign or from somewhere else. The second is you speak good English. That really means who would have thought you, someone of your race would be so articulate. Being, being ignored at the counter, a store owner following, or a store owner following the customer color around the store, which it means you are less valued or poor might steal. Um, the fourth one is there is only one race, the human race. This denies the person as a racial, cultural being and their, so, their societal experiences. 
The fifth one is university, university buildings named after white males or even like streets. That means you don't belong. Someone clutching their wallet or their purse as a black person approaches or passes, that means they're dangerous or they're, they're poor and they might steal. Uh, the last one is, I am not racist, I have black friends. This denies the racism and their racial bias. So I just have a short video to further explain microaggressions on the next slide. Um, so just give us uh, another minute or two to get the video up and, uh, mm -hmm. and then we'll play it for everyone. So Tamika, I'm just having a bit of trouble getting the video up. Would you mind moving on to the next slide while I try to get the video up? Sure, that works. Um, so the next slide is systematic racism. This refers to bias policies, practices, and culture within an organization that reinforce racist standards. Systematic racism creates disadvantages for racialized, racialized groups while advantaging non-racialized groups. Um, next is institutional racism. Uh, these are practices that reinforce racist standards within a workspace or organizations. They're directly and deliberately prevents minorities from full and equal institutional involvement. And to the next in the next slide, I'll be talking about the economic advantages of racism. So throughout the Canadian timeline of racism and colonization, we can see multiple events that took place that involved some sort of economic gain. Example, the Chinese head tax or the slavery, slavery of racialized groups to do labor. And uh, European powers justify colon colonialism as moral obligation to modernize and civilize certain groups, but behind this justifica justification was also the need to gain economic growth and through slavery and the extraction of natural resources. For example, by some estimates, slaveholders extracted more than 14 trillion worth of labor in today's dollars from their captives. Economic gain is still one of the major factors of racism today. So next, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to continue on, on um, what is racism? And then if you have question, you can write the question on the, on the screen um, as we go. So the next one is racism and discrimination. How, how, how racism manifests. So if Jessica, you can uh, move this slide. Thank you. Um, so intersectionality and interconnection of race and racism. Uh, the word intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crimshaw, a black American lady. Um, and the term means it describes the way people's uh, social identity can overlap. It's also a lens, a prism for seeing the way in which various forms of inequality often operates together and exacerbate each other. Um, we tend to talk about race inequality. We tend to talk about race inequality as a separate for, from inequality based on gender, class, sexuality, and immigrant status. So it's important to acknowledge that everyday racism and uh, the discrimination that people experience may be exacerbated based on also on their gender, on their ability, um, and how all of that overlap to with each other. Um, so we also need to also look at uh, the power that they hold, their, their religion. Um, if if it's I am a female and I am a Muslim film, female, I'm a black, black uh, Canadian, all of those will impact uh, the way people will treat me. And all of those is it's it's the overlapping and intersection of all the identity that I hold as a human being. So when we're looking at racism, we have to also consider all of those um, at, at attributes that comes with it. So the next, uh, next slide 
It's talking about racialization and racial profiling. Do you want to click on it, um, Jessica, for me? So racialization and racial profiling, what is racialization? It's the process by which people are selected, they are sorted and given attribute and assigned action um, based on their race again, right? So what is, and that goes into racial profiling. Um, it's a mindset that involves stereotyping of people based on their preconceived idea about that individual characteristics. Um, so when you get stopped by the police, um, you get asked more questions based on who your, your, your physical characteristics. Um, according to Ontario Human Rights Commission, racial, racialization is about the process by which people are selected, sorted, given attribute and assigned action. Social policies and practices maintain and enforce racial boundaries power relations and structurally embedded meanings. So these policies and practices perpetuate a racial hierarchy and can be intentional or non-intentional. Um, the concept of race is sustained through this process that the product of racializations. Um, the fact that society continue to make racialized judgment in all areas of social life highlights the powerful effect and impact it has in people's life. So, for example, in the context of crime and criminal justice, racialization referred to the ways in which criminal justice process and situation use the idea of race. Um, the racialization of crime in Canada has led to racialized individual and group experiencing a range of injustice as criminal identity become fused with racial identity. Um, and racial profiling is a is according to Ontario Human Rights Commission again um, is different from criminal profiling. So racial profiling is based on stereotype assumption because of one's race, color, ethnicity, um, and and sometimes also religion. Criminal profiling, on the other hand, relies on actual behavior or information about suspected activity by someone who meets the description of specific individuals. For example, law enforcement official assumes someone is more likely to have committed a crime because he's African Canadian. Or if we take a moment and, and remember why we're here today, George Floyd, um, he was assumed that the $20 bill, $20, I just want you guys to sit down and sit with it for a second, $20 bill caused someone to lose their life. And in a way that it was very outrageous, um, I don't think an animal can be killed or murdered that way. So if you have $20 with you in your wallet, take it and look at yourself in a mirror. Is $20 worth your life? Worth a human being life? No. So this racial uh, criminal profiling is deeper, it's woven within our behavior, our society, policy, and systems. Um, and I would like us to just have one minute, one minute of silence to remember and honor all of those that we've lost, our brothers, our sisters, our grandparents, grandmothers, through racial profiling through police brutality. One minute and then I'll speak again after. So the next, the next slide. Thank you all. The next slide is on carding. Um, Jessica, do you wanna move on to the next slide? Thank you. So carding, carding is another form of racial profiling where police officer 
stop questions and document individual without any evidence that they have been involved in or have knowledge of or an offense biases and stereotyping play in the officer's decision of who to stop and why which affect many racialized group i have a perfect example last fall uh, one of two of my colleagues were traveling to um, another province to go speak on human right and uh, racism and one of them is a black male youth um, well relatively youth which between 20 and 25 um, and this person was stopped at the airport two times and was fully stripped because he fitted the racial profiling of a gang member just because he was black the way he he dressed the way he was talking put him under the box and can you imagine you are going to talk about anti-racism and human right and you're being stopped just because of your race and because of who you are as an individual just sit with that for a moment and imagine that person has to ground themselves and recollect themselves in order to go and and provide that presentation in a manner that is impactful so that way he doesn't fall or doesn't fit again in another box of the angry black male. So, so police practice of documenting the personal details of people, um, usually with no charge laid. Um, in 1957 in Toronto, police were given actual cards called suspect cards to document and forward information about person of interest to detective. Over the years, the card became a form and later it became, or it's now called report. So by 2015, the practice was called community engagement. By the term carding, stuck and still involve random stop of citizen and collection of personal data, um, including details of physical appearance, address, contact information, in 2016, Toronto police had effectively ended the practice of carding. However, there are still reports that informal, um, informal carding still takes place, um, especially in Toronto Transit Commission vehicle and even here in Manitoba. The next slide. So racial profiling and carding often leads, sorry, often leads to police committing acts of violence. Um, and that has been the result of now George Floyd being on the news. Unfortunately, it, it only doesn't affect George Floyd, but that event, that experience has affected all black folks in the world. And they have lived that experience every day the only difference that we're having today is that we're able to film it and broadcast it through our te technology, our phone. Um, and unfortunately, we had to see and witness somebody being murdered on the live TV or te uh, phone in order for us to take action. Black residents in Toronto are, are 20 times more likely to die in a police shooting than their white counterpart. Black resident in Toronto also account for 25% of police involved in shooting when they make up only 8.8% .8 of the population. Um, next slide will be on racial discrimination. So racial discrimination um, can often be subtle um, as such, assigned to less desirable uh, jobs, being denied a mentoring position or a training. Um, it also means facing different job standards than the other workers. Uh, also, or being denied an apartment because you just look different than the other person. Um, so I'm going to move on quickly because I'm keeping an eye on, on the clock as well. And then the next slide talks about our judicial system 
where uh, I'm calling it, it, it becomes the um, prison has become the modern slavery. Um, and why I say that is because it turns into a production system where we see more black male being incarcerated. Like one of my stats here, um, in the past 10 years, we've seen an increase of 70% of black male being detained, while the, the whole population of black male in Canada is only 3%. Um, we're also seeing the same pattern where indigenous people are being incarcerated at a 50% rate um, versus their counterpart white uh, individual, white population. And they only, the makeup of the population is extremely so small that we start wondering what's going on, right? Um, so having said that, um, how can we change it? Um, how can we switch this? these events that are happening. And then um, also looking, when we're talking about judicial system, the penalty or the sentencing um, of black people is worse and far harsh than anybody else. Um, we are also looking at, for example, in, in the state, there, were, there was a Somalian police officer who accidentally shot a white woman um, and he was sentenced to 12, 12 to 13 years in prison um, versus Omid Berry who was jogging and ended up dying just because these two individuals felt that he may be, um, he may fit in this box that we were talking about where they believe that he, he's out there um, he has no good intention and they, he, they killed him and it took almost two months in order for these people to be arrested. And we look again, not, not weeks later, um, George Floyd, the same thing. So the way we're sentencing or we are um, punishing this crime, I'm not saying not to punish, let's punish, but let's all, with, let's punish to the same level, to the same, um, understanding and standard. The next slide talks about, um, it's a video, but I will skip that video, but I'll invite you to go on on your own and search um, how to stop indigenous women from disappearing. Uh, it's a great TED, talk, TED Talks and it invites us to look into we're all human being and every human being has a connection, whether with Mother Earth, whether with the people around us. So let's uh, leverage all those connections that we have because we are interconnected to change the system. My next slide is on lateral violence. So I hear people asking, what about black on black crime? <laughs> um, black on black crime, it doesn't, I'm not saying that that's not as important as police profiling. I'm not saying that that's less important as the injustice that we've been talking so far. But we have also to understand where the black on black crime is coming from. What's the root cause of it? Lateral violence is stem from um, the way people in a position of powerlessness um, covertly or overtly direct their dissatisfaction, their frustration inward towards each other. Um, it's, a, it's a colonialism um, response where you want to identify as your colonizer and be better than the people who look the same as you. So as a result, we, in, we inflict the pain, the pain that we have internally, we inflict those pain to the people who look like us. Um, but that is also as a result of oppression, um, it's a result of marginalization, powerlessness, um, continuous or ongoing racism and discrimination and prejudice that we experience. The next slide is on um, anti-racism around COVID. 
So not only we are experiencing the loss of people, but we are like the racism that are showing up now, we are also in the midst of a pandemic season. So it's like a sandwich or a double sandwich where in one hand you're dealing with COVID response and how to adjust your life around it, but also you're also dealing with this embedded racism that is woven within our, the fabric of our society. Um, we pulled together a few stats on COVID-19, but also Jessica from Immigration Partnership Winnipeg, they have a anti-racism COVID-19 uh, campaign that they're, go that they're also hearing some of these things that I'll be sharing with you, that they're hearing people are being discriminated, people are, are experiencing um, um, oppression just because of who and what they look like. So since there have been an increase in the um, there have been an increase in racist incident. Um, so far, we have 138 incidents of COVID-19 related racism act, with 110 of those being reported in May. Only May, 110. Um, and if we break those down, eight of those incidents was in Ontario, 36 in BC. 15 in Quebec. Um, of those reported experience, experiencing racism, we have 80% were from East Asia and 11% were from South Asia, 3% indigenous, 2% black, and 4% described as others. Um, the, the most type of harassment were verbal harassment, intentional uh, speeding and coughing and exclusion or refuse to access the premise. Um, we've been hearing more and more of these um, incidents happening uh, throughout with either uh, neighbors telling their neighbors to go back to China. Um, I had my colleague here who's one of one of the leadership team here uh, being told in, in, the, in the shop and the grocery store to go back to where she's coming from. And she's not even from China, she's from Philippine. Um, so understanding those microaggression and discrimination that is not only impacting uh, uh, people during COVID-19, <laughs> during a pandemic season, but also during their everyday life. The next slide, it talks about the impact of all of this on our mental health and our physical health. Um, at times, targeted individuals may find themselves questioning, um, questioning whether, did this really happen to me? Or am I going crazy? Or am I dreaming about it? because we don't also talk much about it. So, and um, in Canada, we don't acknowledge as often the, the wrong that we've done in the past, that we are a diverse, welcoming community, therefore is not really, it's almost diminishing the experience of those who have been um, racialized, who have been discriminated, who have been marginalized. Um, so often the marginalized population or racialized population will go through this and start wondering, maybe it's me who's making it up in my head. Um, so that compounded going back and forth, there's no, there's no proper healing. And then when there is healing and other incidents happen, when the incidents happen, you, you are constantly, constantly on a hypervigilant state or in a trauma state that you are not, a, your body, your, 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 your mental health, your physical health has not had the time to recover before another incident happen again. It's like living with a bear every day. Um, the fear, the, um, the worry, the anger, all the feelings that you people experience is constantly on the go and, and there is no time to rest. So the compound grief, uh, the pain that people experience leads to racial trauma. 
And when racial trauma happens, we also need to take care of ourselves and find ways when, how we can stop, how we can heal and continue. So despite the rise in racial microaggression, forms of racism continue to plague our system. Um, ethnic minority community and um, are constantly triggered and are constantly living on a, on a trigger stress response. The next slide. So, um, we want to talk about how to talk about this. I am sorry, these are so heavy topic, um, but we want to talk about how our children or how do we talk about it to our children um, on the topic of racism. So I've heard people telling me, well, my, my child is so young. Um, I don't want to talk about it because I, don't, I want my children to see everybody as the same. Well, that's where we have a problem because we are unique in our own ways, whether we put skin color aside, we are all unique. So we can lump everybody in a salad bowl and say we're all the same and we're equal. We are not. So some of this conversation can start as early as three years old, where um, you're talking to your children about the differences we all hold, whether it's through our beauty, through our ways of thinking, um, through our response in behavior. Um, so children will start asking, um, as, like I have an example where a child asked the other, th their parents, mom, why is that child look dirty? And the mom will shush the kid, will say, shush, don't say that, that's not allowed. <laughs> but we should instead say, you know what? They're not dirty. They're, that's how they look, and they're beautiful in, in that color. The way we have our color in purple, the way we, our hair color in purple, in red, in gray. I love Lauren's hair color right now because it has a gray and purplish color. Um, so all of that brings the uniqueness and the diversity that we hold as individuals. So instead of shushing that child, we should be telling them how beautiful it is to be different and how unique brings us together, right? So we can't be the same. We have to be different to some degree. Um, you have to model empathy, start buying books of children that have uh, racialized children and read about it, discuss the emotional reaction, educational movies, sometimes depending on the age of, the, of your children, um, but also, having some dolls or toys that are diverse, that are racialized, um, so that way your children can understand. One way to model empathy can be start talking about anti-black racism. Um, that if, if your child expressed concern about what they're seeing affecting another child or family, share how they can act in defense of that person. How can they stick up, uh, stand up for that person? Um, dis discuss their emotional reactions. So, for example, for older youth, um, talking about their emotional reaction to unfairness treatment, um, I, I hear it often where youth will share with us that um, they were put in a group, but at the end, I mean, the teacher would ask them to be in a group, but then they find themselves not being, being left out. So everybody have chosen their group click or the group people and that young boy was left out and the teacher had to assign him a group so how can a youth or how can our team can stand up for that child that other youth how can they welcome them into their circle um parent can also make good use of um uh, when you're at home use good use of movies or um, history um, documentary to talk about it. The next slide. It talks about inclusive parents and anti-racist parents. Um, so inclusive parents, we teach, teach their kids that people matter more than their skin color, make sure their child library is racially diverse, 
share movies and show featuring people of color with their kids, talks about privileges and what it means, uh, what privilege means. Versus anti-racist parent teach their kids that skin color deeply affect how people view us and how people treat us. Intentionally includes book that go beyond slavery, uh, the civil rights movement. They use media to point out examples of racism and stereotype. They give their children contextual example of their privilege, like being able to shop without being being followed. Okay. Now, um, how to talk to, how to talk about race with your racialized children. You have, that's very important because like me, I have two boys who were born in Canada. One of them deeply, deeply believe that they're Canadian and holds all the privileges as white Canadian, their friend, um, which is not true. <laughs> so we start talking about uh, what that looked like for him as he's growing. We start talking, building his self-esteem, but also self-worth. Uh, we don't want, I don't want him to go into that, that message that he keeps hearing that black are bad, that black are end up being gangster. But instead I told him, hey, you can be the next president. You can be anything you want to be, as long as we work hard for it, as long as you continue, to keep that objective on the line. Um, build their self-esteem, teach them how to stand up for themselves. Um, I've had to teach them that your skin color is black, but not brown. So when, when other kids are teasing you and calling you brown, chocolate brown, remind them and correct them that actually, no, I am black, I'm not brown. So understand those differences, teach them about the different dimension of racism and how it manifests. And I love this quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So if you can live with that and remind yourself of that quote all the time, that would be great. That would be another start. Uh, Jessica, next slide. So model of ethnic identity. Um, these are stages of how we build our, our identity as individuals. Um, stage one, we look at examining ethnic identity. So looking at um, exploring your own ethnicity, uh, the, you might be disinterested in doing so. Some minority students may initially accept at the attitude of the dominant culture. Some may reject it. Um, attitude toward exploring an ethnic identity are influenced by several factors. So some of those several factors includes their, non, their ethnicity is a non-issue, which can lead to diffusion or foreclosure. Some individuals may rely strong, their strong view of ethnicity um, and appear in the stage three, which we'll talk about it next. Um, the next stage of ethnic identity um, search, the more moratorium. Uh, sometimes we may remain in stage one and we go back and forth. So it's a, it's a con continuous search and continuous development um, until they encounter a situation that causes them to explore deeper. Um, the situation may be harsh, overt racism, or it can be gradual, less traumatic. So this is a time of experimentation where we talk with friends and family and wonder what's going on, why me? Why am I experiencing this? Uh, wanting to learn more about your own culture, wanting to take courses about it, attend culture events, uh, maybe an emotional intense stage where the anger, the guilt, the embarrassment start coming up. Um, and then an individual can remain in this stage for a little bit longer before they move on to stage three, which is the final um, identity stage, um, where we resolve our, our co identity conflict and accept membership into minority culture, but also open to other culture. Uh, the best outcome will be for individuals to have a secure ethnic identity and positive orientation towards mainstream culture, and you become confident and calm. But 
I will take a step further to that where youth who are racialized youth who are growing in Western countries, often, depending on how at home it's happening, they carry two identity all the time. I have to please my parents and, and follow the traditional beliefs and practices while that at school I have to hold a different identity so I can be accepted into my friends group so I can be accepted into the mainstream the cool mainstream welcoming kid so we have also to be mindful of our of racialized kid that they might be going back and forth within that identity internally and that can also cause some mental health some trauma um, if we are not handling it properly and then also starting to unpack the trauma that people may have experienced um, throughout throughout um, their life um, having so having these difficult conversation we need to start talking about radical responsibility uh, for our action, implementing healthy routine, setting and enforcing boundary, and when we're safe enough, unpacking the trauma. And that's where the healing will start. So I think the next stage, I will pass it on to Lauren, my colleague, who will um, take you on to a specific action that we can do. All right, great. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. I'm going to um, take this off. So that will... Zoom. Okay, um, so we're going to have a bit of a conversation now around moving forward and um, how we can act. This um, information is coming um, a bit from uh, a perspective of uh, bystanders and those. I know many of us stated that we didn't really experience uh, racism personally, but we have witnessed racism um, and kind of what we can do. I encourage everyone, if you're looking for more information on how to be an ally, please attend our next webinar and I can... Um, hopefully promise or hopefully semi-guarantee that hopefully we won't have as many technical issues in the next webinar on the 25th, I believe it is, um, at the same time. And that's where we'll discuss, discuss further in depth allyship and what it means to be an ally and how we can do that. Uh, but this is more of a, a quick overview. Um, so, sorry, Jessica, if you can just keep clicking for me till I get all the information. So I know many of us may be witnessing um, acts of discrimination or racism or harassment that we are seeing. Um, and it's good for us at this stage um, to be angry. And I'm happy to hear that uh, people are struggling and that people are, well, not struggling, but that people are angry and upset about what is happening and is struggling with what is going on in the world. Um, that anger is really good. But before we enter into situations where we want to use our anger, and we might, if we see it on the street, someone, or we see it in a store, um, someone that is racially profiling somebody else, we need to ensure that there's safety for everyone before we respond. Um, take that anger and fuel it and use it, but use it after everyone is safe. Um, so make sure that we, in that moment, if we're witnessing it, focus on de-escalation um, and ensuring that everybody is safe. Looking at exit routes, are there ways that we can support people in getting out? What does that look like? Um, we need to be aware, um, particularly as allies or the bystanders that are witnessing it, to be aware that our choices of interventions may have impact on the uh, persons involved, uh, particularly the person that is experiencing the racism. It's entirely possible that by getting involved um, without ensuring everyone's safety that we can escalate the violence um, and have that be worse. And there are going to be occasions where people may not want our support. And as allies, we need to be okay with that. Um, there tends to be, which we'll talk more in the allyship um, slide, our allyship uh, webinar, we'll talk a bit more about the concept of white saviorness or this need to rescue. And sometimes that's not our place to be rescuing because we may be silencing people's voices. Um, a story that I'm going to share in the next webinar, but that I'll share with you guys really quick, was a previous 
uh, coworker of mine used to work at a uh, casino and was a manager there. And he noticed that one of his indigenous employees was being harassed by a group of customers. So he got quite upset and hobbled out there and said that they don't stand for that. That's not okay. And kicked everybody out and uh, came back looking all proud um, to that point with his, when his indigenous employee looked at him and said, I can speak for myself, you know. Um, and so that can be a way that we are actually silencing people's voices that need to come out. Um, so it's best if we're seeing these situations to instead ask the person that's experiencing the racism, what we can do to help. How can I help you? I'm seeing what's happening. Is there anything you need from me? Is there anything I can do to help this situation? And be okay if they say no, because they may, they, they may say no and may not want that type of support. And we have to be okay with saying, okay, well, if you do need, I'm over here. I'm off to the side. Um, right, so, and continue to assess that situation and can continue to engage with the person that may be um, targeted, continuing to ask, do you, are you sure, like, I'm still here if you need, but really respect that fact that they may not want our support. And then if they say, yes, I need your help, can you, you know, pretend to be a friend of mine and, and get me out of here? Can you, you know, whatever it may be, can you videotape what's happening? Um, can you stand to the side? Then doing those types of things can be really helpful. Um, and it's really about empowering the individual that is being targeted to be able to um, speak and stand up on their own. Um, do not engage with the individual that is um, promoting the racism or is the attacker. Um, again, we don't want the situation to escalate and there to be more violence and then continue to monitor. Uh, really what we can do with, because you're going to feel angry and you're going to be upset that this is happening. And what we, what we want people to do rather than in those moments where, they, where the situation could become escalated, take that anger and fuel it to talk to your friends and families and coworkers um, about what's happening in the world and the notion of anti-racism and how we can help. Speak up on the injustices, contact your MLAs, uh, push for changes. Um, and really, we need to also be sure to never stop educating ourselves and being aware that regardless of who we are, regardless of what experience we have, we all come from a place um, where we have our own stereotypes, our own biases, and our own belief systems about, about things. And they can sneak up on us in ways that we don't expect. Um, the other story I share about ways that this can um, sneak up on us is I've got a lot of experience working with the Nehiao community. Um, and one time I was very excited to go and speak with an elder, Dr. Liana Makokas, um, and I was going to go ask her some questions that I had regarding this. I was in school at the time, so regarding a presentation I was doing, and I was very excited to meet this, this woman that I thought was really important um, in the community. And so I got myself all dressed up in my little, little white way that I do with the little sh put on my heels, wore my fancy suit, got myself ready to go um and decided to move to go forward um and go and meet her and so as i went to go meet her where she works is at uh, blue quills college um and um so i went to blue quills college which is a residential school which has been taken over by the community um so as we are walking through um the residential school and um i realized the person that was with me actually looked at me and said what are you wearing? And I said, what, what's wrong? They look at me and go, the nuns wore heels. And so I didn't realize the clicking of my heels down those hallways could re-traumatize people that work there, um, that had been at that school as students. So those are ways that my westernized lens was blinded and that actually could hurt someone. So being very aware, always monitoring ourselves and always working to educate ourselves and recognize that just because we have biases doesn't mean that we can support and change those biases and work to being better people. And it doesn't mean that we don't care. It just, we live in a society where it's deep, where these stereotypes and these belief systems are deeply ingrained. So we need to be willing to acknowledge it and acknowledge the fact that none of us are perfect when it comes to this. Um, so the next slide is a video. Again, um, since we're having some issues with videos, um, we won't be playing it. It's called Cracking the Code. Um, and I really recommend people to be able to go and check it out. Um, so Lauren, I actually, I, I think I can get it up. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. I will come on. So just bear with me here. My sister-in-law, uh, who's half black, half white, 
but looks white. Blue eyes, whiter than most white folks. Very white. Uh, she and I, you know, we kind of grew up together. We raised our children together. Uh, so they're first cousins. And we, you know, it's the wonderful, very, very multicultural family. So we're going in a safe way one day. And um, Kathleen, my, my sister-in-law, is in front of me. And she's, uh, you know, writing a check for her groceries. Now, my daughter, who at the time was 10 years old, was standing with me and I was directly behind her, you know, getting ready to get my groceries. So Kathleen comes up and the checker, who is a strawberry blonde, um, freckled, very delightful, warm, um, you know, the checker, this young woman is talking to Kathleen. Hey, how you doing? This is a nice day today. They're just chatting up and she says, yes. Yeah. So Kathleen writes her her check and she steps off to the side with her groceries because she's waiting for me. Of course, again, Kathleen looks white, right? So I come up, no conversation. She looks up at me, absolutely no, just a little chatter. And uh, I write my check. My daughter, however, is 10, notices immediately the difference in how she responds to me. So I write my check and she goes, I'm going to need two pieces of ID. At which point my daughter looks at me and she gets very, very embarrassed and tears are, are, are kind of coming up in her eye like, mommy, you're not going to you're not going to let her do this. Why is she doing this to us? Right. So I'm trying to figure out what I should do, because behind me are two elderly white women. Right. And I'm thinking, OK, so then I become the angry black woman. Right. And they're going to be. And I just I'm, I'm just trying to second guess all the drama. So then I, I just give her the two pieces of ID. I said, you know, some things you got to choose your battles, right? And then it gets worse. She pulls out the bad check book, right? So the, this is the book that shows the people who have written bad checks. So she starts searching for my license in the bad checks, at which point it's just out of control now. Just as I'm standing there um, trying to decide what to do, and it's really deeply humiliating. Now my, my daughter is in full-blown emotionally upset, who's 10. My sister-in-law walks back over, and she steps in, and she says, excuse me, why are you doing this? And the checker goes, well, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? She goes, why are you taking her through all of these changes? Why are you doing that? She goes, well, um, this is our policy. She goes, no, it's not your policy, because you didn't do that with me. Oh, well. I know you, you've been, she goes, no, no, she's been here for years. I've only lived here for three months. And so at this point, the two white elderly ladies go, oh, I can't believe what this checker has done with this woman. And it's totally unacceptable. At which point the manager walks over. So the manager walks over and says, is there a problem here? And then my sister-in-law again responds. She goes, yes, there is a problem here. Here is what happened. So you see, she used her white privilege. And even though Kathleen is half black and half white, she recognizes what that means. And she made the statement. She pointed out the injustice. And she, as a result of that one act, influenced everyone in that space. But what would have happened? I can't know for certain had the black woman said, this is unfair. Why are you doing this to me? Would it have had the same impact? But Kathleen knew that she walked through the world differently than I did. And she used her white privilege to educate and make right a situation that was wrong. That's what you can do every single day. Great, thank you, Jessica. Um, so as we saw in the video, that is an example of a way in which we can be allies in the way that we can. Um, and the way that we can uh, utilize potentially our own privilege to assist others um, and to help others. Again, it's important to balance um, this with the rescuing and running in. Um, one example I always use when I talk about this kind of stuff is my stepfather um, who works very closely with Dr. Leona Makokis. Um, and what they will happen is often they will go to meetings and Leona will speak first and she will always speak what needs to be said and Ralph will stand as backup. And then as soon as, and this has happened in several meetings, um, where they won't hear Leona because she's an indigenous woman. And my stepfather is a very large, uh, redneck looking farmer kind of guy um, who's in social work. It's very weird. Um, but he will stand behind her and they won't hear Leona. And so Leona will say, Ralph, speak. And that's Ralph's cue. 
that it's his turn to say what needs to be said because it's heard differently from him as a white male. Um, and so these are ways of supporting those within our community that um, to have their voice without to take that voice for them, even though our intentions may be good. So we're gonna move on to the next slide. Um, so we have here a list of some different um, resources, some movies that you can watch, some books that you may be able to read, and some podcasts and things like that that you'd be able to listen to to help and continue to educate yourselves as well as those around you um, and encouraging others to um, participate with you and listen, watching as a family, those types of things. So these are just um, a list of different ones that exist. So we'll move on again. So we really, uh, we always want to encourage and provide some resources for individuals that may be struggling. Um, Elmwood Community Resource Center here in Winnipeg does provide individual as well as group-based counseling available at no cost. So if individuals that you're aware of are struggling with what is happening um, and are requiring some additional support, that is an option. We also um, provide, do as much advocacy as we can on behalf of our clients and those that need that. Um, we also, you can also file complaints at the Human, uh, Manitoba Human Rights Commission um, in order to do that, as well as please feel free to access our web website uh, where there's many different resources, including a um, anti-racist framework for the workplace that people can access and take a look at. Um, so these are just some of the resources that exist um, out there. It's really, um, sorry, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, so, I mean, a big piece of as we move forward is um, what are we going to do and how are we going to commit to change? Um, it's really important that we um, make sure that what's happening doesn't become a hashtag which then fades um, once it no longer becomes the hot button issue. Uh, we want this to continue and to move forward beyond um, to real, actual, systemic change for individuals and for those within our community. Um, these are some questions that I know um, I myself have asked myself and that I continue and encourage people to think about as they move forward. Um, and that what we do. Um, so it can be questions around, do I stay silent when I hear racist comments? see racial injustice, have an opportunity to stand up for a person of color because I'm afraid of how it will be perceived by white people? Am I worried if I spoke up it might negatively affect my friendships, my jobs, my relationship with family who maybe hold different belief systems? What's keeping me silent? Um, what's keeping me from moving forward and being aware of that? Um, do, I, uh, do I say things that, and attempt to shift the focus away from race? Um, because I want to be less controversial or I want it to be a more comfortable conversation. I'm afraid of going there. I'm afraid of what that means. And um, another question can be, do I condemn the actions taken by other individuals um, and by those that are angry without acknowledging the validity of their pain and doing anything constructive to support their cause? Um, so when we're looking at individuals that may be looting and our first gut reaction may be to say, well, looting doesn't help anything. Um, where is that coming from? And are we actually doing anything other than that to continue um, the change? It's really important to remember and what I've said to a few people is that the race for racial equality is a marathon. It is not a sprint. Um, and so this is something that we have developed over since the beginnings of Canada and the pro beginning process of colonization, this has begun. Um, so it's going to take a while to undo it, um, but there is a lot that we can do to help move that forward and push that forward. And a big part of that is taking care of ourselves and looking at our own biases, our own beliefs, and where do those come from, um, and, and pushing for real change. We want to move to the next slide. Um, if you feel the urge uh, to do something in these difficult times with the grief and anger that you may be feeling. Uh, please channel this anger um, into actions. Don't let it fade away. Um, 
it's really important to remember that the status quo remains uh, because we pass off the responsibility to others uh, rather than taking on that responsibility to ourselves. Um, it can be as simple as writing to the MLA, asking for change, pushing for that, voting, um, voting for individuals um, that support anti-racist movements and pushing that forward. Um, it can also be as simple as if you're in a workplace and you see something. I know there was an occasion in one of my previous workplaces where I wasn't comfortable with what was happening and I said straight up, you can do this, but I'm not going to support it. I won't be the one that does this. Um, I'd have to step and I didn't necessarily have to leave the job, but I had to make that known and state that I wouldn't be present at that table. Um, so there are little things that we can do. Um, indigenous uh, people and those in racialized communities are constantly worried about their child or their loved one that isn't going to be treated the same way as a white person and won't be treated by police properly uh, or worse might not come home because of racially motivated interactions and being very aware that that, that reality exists for others um, even if it doesn't exist for ourselves and being very very cautious about what that means for our end of, for others. So we'll move on to the next slide. Um, so this is moving forward towards a call to action and I'm going to pass this over to Nina as this is um, her call to action. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so some of these are just my own call to action, but I thought I'll share it with everyone so that way you can use it as well. Um, my first one is understanding what the difference between Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter. Um, and then understanding that at this point, at this moment, right now, here and now, it's about Black Lives Matter. Every life matters, but at this moment, we're talking about Black Lives Matter, um, uh, which takes the spotlight and also remembering that um, the critical issues of Black people, Black folks, um, that they're experiencing right now, where we ended up le uh, losing someone, um, that the video has been broadcasted as a, I'm going to excuse my language, but as a, um, a porn movie uh, is not acceptable, and we don't want people to become desensitized to the issue at hand. Um, so my concern uh, is also to remember that I, we need to keep this at the forefront of our mind, that it needs to be solved um, and not skewed away from how we interpret these, these videos that are constantly in our face now. Um, it has not lost on me that I here speaking, I hold some privilege. Um, I have influences and status that my other black female may not have. So how do I use my privilege to support others, to support my community, um, to advocate for the advancing of racial inclusion and awareness for my community, but also bringing our awareness and training and tangible commitment to social equity. My third call to action is to talk to employer, perhaps um, gather together with colleagues who are allies in the community to look at um, what can we do more within our workspace to take a stand against racism, educate all employees about issues of race and equity, and um, identify, advocate for ways the workspace can do more to undo racism that are internally and externally. Um, the next call to action for me is to set meetings with school administrator, uh, school divisions to look into how can curriculum, school curriculum can begin to include education on race and racism, biases, social equity, system change, um, and how can we teach our children that they can be the influence of, of the next generation, right? So avoiding the ero erosure of history, but instead uh, bringing that history back. Um, to talk to, like Lauren said before, to, to see if we can talk to um, 
police department elected officials, um, uh, especially with the police department, how it's important to, to police officer for me uh, to instead of defunding the police, but instead put training into the police system. Um, encouraging police officer to end racially based uh, policing behavior, brutality, training into de-escalation first aid or psychological first aid, understanding uh, systems and equity, um, putting on body cameras uh, to be mandatory and not to turn it off, um, to talk about various systems and policymaker on ways to er eliminate the mass incarceration. Um, to appoint, I'm not sure, I don't know if everybody knows this, but to appoint a, a neutral body uh, of individual to join the police investigation unit and make the recommendation to public and follow through with those recommendations. But more importantly also to give authority to um, to the police investigator unit to make sure that they they can implement those recommendations and those recommendations will be followed through. But also building community of um, community resource officers who are out there in the in the community and building relationship with the community, but not to be using as a lip service, I am sorry, but to be fully action and impactful action. Next slide. So this is all the upcoming event on anti-racism training um, that uh, Immigration Partnership Winnipeg is partnering with other service provider to do the training. So please join um, another, all the training that are coming up. Um, we have next one will be Virtual Ethic Cafe on June 18. And then um, another one will be on anti-racism or becoming an ally, effective allyship on June 25th that Lauren mentioned earlier. Um, and then another training we are looking at uh, IPW and Menso is, is looking at doing another one on for those supporting those who have experienced uh, racism, but more detail to come. Okay, so we have well, we have a few minutes for questions. I'll pass it on to Jessica. All right, thank you so much, Nina, uh, Tamika, and Lauren for that fantastic uh, presentation. We really all, um, obviously, I can't speak on behalf of everyone, but I found it really, really informative, so thank you so much. Um, Nina, do you first want to do the poll, the final poll? Sorry? Would you like to do the, the final poll? Yes, yes, please, okay. yes. Okay. Let's do the poll, okay. Last little form of engagement. So this is talking about next steps. So we give you guys about three, three minutes to look it through and, and see what are two tangible actions that, that from here you'll take in pursuit of justice and equality as you all move on with your lives. So um, the top one was, I'll actively learn more about racism and anti-racism with 55% of those um, in the webinar right now saying that that's one of the tangible actions that you'll, you'll take, so that's fantastic. I think this was a good step, um, like a good introduction. And I believe Nina, we had talked about this, that these two trainings are really an introduction to anti-racism and, and folks understanding and further learning about anti-racism and the hope was to have a more in-depth training in the fall of the summer. I'm trying to look at them fast. The next step I think was uh, I'll continue to assess and unpack my own privilege. And after that, well, I'll call out racism when I see it. I'll talk to my friends and family about anti-racism. These are fantastic. So thank you so much for participating in our poll and um, committing to these these actions. All right, um, and Nina, are we okay to move on to questions? We have about 20 minutes? Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, throughout the presentation, there were some questions that were posted in the question box. So I'm just gonna go over those. Um, the first was when 
um, I, think, I believe it was Tamika was talking about the different types of racism. And the question is, are there any of those four types of racism that are more prevalent in Canada? Or is it a mix of them? Um, yes, I can speak to that. This is Lauren here. Smika's just getting herself um, reorganized. Um, so I can speak to that. I, I'd i say what we tend to see um, more frequently is um, it's the systemic uh, racism that exists um, and that's embedded deeply within um, our community. And that is the, the part that has the biggest impact, I would say, um, or that I see on people more so than any other form of racism. Because um, while to some degree we can justify it as if someone, oh, he called me a name, um, but as opposed to, oh, I go and apply for a job and I can't get a job because of my race has a deeper impact. Um, so being aware of that. And I'd say that that is really a big area where um, we're seeing it and what's happening and where the change needs to be. Yeah, I think that's where the misconception comes of like where Canada's not racist because it's kind of hidden within the system. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the next question is again on the topics of the different types of racism. Um, so the question is, I'm not quite sure I understand the difference between systematic and institutional racism and where systematic racism, sorry, systematic racism fits into the typology. Systematic versus institutional. The, the systematic comes within all the institutions uh, of racism that are happening. Um, institutional racism can come in the form of uh, school, let's say. Sorry, I'm picking up on schools right now. But <laughs> um, schools, I'll give an example where newcomer, newcomer youth are given credit of e-credit, um, which means when they graduate school, um, they're grade 12, really they can go anywhere. They cannot be accepted into university with that ECRA. That's, that's an institutional racism. Um, it's systematic racism. It's all the system embedded within everything that we do. So if we look at that, if we break it down too and look at it, it's not just the police that's the issue, but it's also our court system. It's also um, our government system, which supports that. It's also where we're, and that leaks into who we're voting for and who's having power. So that's the systems. It's all interconnected in that way. Um, institution looks at one piece, one piece of that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we had a couple questions about the difference, so that's really helpful. Another one was, can you recommend some movies, books to show and read to children? Yes, um, there is a list of books and movies on our website. So I won't go through that, but I will invite you to go on our website um, under tools and to racism resources. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so the next one is, what language should we be using to address racism without falling into being racist ourselves? It's about, um, for me, it's about intention more so than the actual language which is being used. Um, I always go by what the individual identifies themselves as and I utilize that language with that individual. Um, my phrase example is I have a girlfriend um, uh, who is uh, living in a wheelchair um, and she refers to herself as gibbled. Um, and for her, although for some people that's incredibly offensive, uh, but for her, it's actually very empowering. Um, and that she, she takes that word and takes it back. Um, so I support her in doing that. I would never use that with another individual, but if that's what she needs, then I support that. Um, whereas for others, and as a white person, I utilize the term indigenous, um, if I'm not familiar, because the word aboriginal, the root word is um, ab original, so unoriginal. Um, and so that's why I use the word indigenous. Um, but again, it's kind of what that person identifies and supporting people in their own identities and what that looks like and what that is. Um, and being very cautious about just being aware of language. And again, if you make a mistake, people as long as you own up to the mistake or you apologize for it and say, you know what, I'm actually pretty ignorant in this. What should I be using? You can ask and that's okay. Lots of times we're not expected to know everything. Um, so it's good to, you, you can ask and it's about the intention of, I want to learn because I want to be supportive as opposed to, I want to learn so I can take it over. And lots of times if you put yourself out there and say, I want to learn, people will teach. And then, um, in addition to that is, um, 
so within each each ethnic group um like i always refer myself as a black female black kid african canadian um and i'm comfortable with that but some people were versus my husband who's also black male will not be comfortable to for you to refer him as black male he would just say you know refer me as my name um so you have to ask for permission to that person how would you like me to refer to you as and that really stems from a place of curiosity and respect and dignity. Great, thank you. Um, there was a further uh, clarification on the question. Um, when they're asking what language should we use uh, to address racism, um, what, what language to use the, the attackers? So if somebody is use it, saying um, like a verbal assault, what's some language to use against those people? So the offenders. Yeah, okay, I can speak a little bit to this. Um, one of my tricks and what I do is, I, you, what you can do is you can validate someone's feelings without va validating what they're saying. Um, so often if people will say, uh, for example, oh, all the immigrants are taking white jobs or taking jobs away from Canadians, um, I will validate, you know what, it must be very, it can be very scary to feel like there's not enough resources for everyone and that you're not safe. However, and then I follow it up with some information that immigrants are actually not um, taking people's jobs, that they're not doing that. But I find as soon as we go into, you're being racist, people will pull back. Um, so, it's, so if you're entering into those, so start with validating the emotion behind what's being said, the frustration, the anger, the fear typically is where a lot of it is rooted in. Um, and then follow that up with information and correct information. And I think um, we'll follow more into this in our next training on the 25th for mm -hmm. the allyship with hopefully we'll, we'll be able to work out our, our technology where we can do more exercises and be more um, actively engaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Uh, okay, so the next question is learning these foundations is long overdue. Where does Manitoba sit in terms of educating our young people, next generations? Is there curriculum? Do we have Indigenous and racialized people contributing, advising to this curriculum? Yeah, that's a, the, the question around um, like uh, curriculum for in-school training on this. Um, there's, there's not a whole lot that's happening, unfortunately. Um, there is some in some other provinces um, that's happening. Mm -hmm. I know that in Alberta, um, Leona, um, that I spoke about, the elder, she's actually um, was a part of a team that started putting some curriculum together for elementary schools and things of that nature that started getting put out there. Um, but we do need more of it and we need more of it from not a westernized lens about what's happened in our history, but from a racialized lens. One other piece that I'll add on is um, as part of the ally, ally or action to do is, I know that in the past we've been against collecting stats based on race, but I think it's important now to do culturally appropriate, culturally sensitive stats collection of data so that way we know how many people from different race background we have in our school system in order for us to have proper curriculum. Because Africa is not a, a country, it's a continent. So we have over 50 countries in it, um, and we all have different cultures. So you cannot just englobe everybody in one segment. Thank you, Nina, and thank you, Lauren. Okay, so this is um, a really exciting uh, question. So it first starts off with, thank you so much. This was an amazing training. I, I do feel like there's um, so much more to learn though. Is it possible to offer a donation to, um, uh, the development of more training or help support these type of uh, programs. Um, so before I let the Elmwood team talk, um, if, if you're looking to give a donation to anyone, I, I, any organization, I really do think um, if you, you could give a donation to Elmwood um, Community Resource Center, they have a, you go, just go on their website and there's a donate page. Um, they did so much work to put this training together and it obviously weighs a lot on them to put this type of material together and present it and it's um, quite a taxing type of process. So um, if, you, if you have the means and you're wanting to do something financially, uh, I, I'd plug to provide a donation to the Elmwood team. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Um, I'm gonna actually 
answer back to the, the first question, um, the last question where uh, somebody was asking, what are we doing to educate our youth? I would say um, I want to give credit to Canadian Heritage Department and Immigration um, RCC, where recently we've had funding to do exactly what we're doing now is teaching the youth how to learn how to respond appropriate, appropriately on, um, on racism action, but also how to cope and take that those information at home and work with their family so they don't always have to carry the two identity that I, we re referenced before. Yeah. Thank you, Mia. Okay, so another question is, I've seen some very, oh, sorry. Sorry, I just want to also encourage people to be aware that this fight for racial equality has been happening long before this and will continue long after. Um, so if people are really interested and really want to be involved, look at organizations that have been doing the work before this and those organizations that have plans to continue to do the work after this. Um, and those are the people that you can align yourself, whether that's through monetary donations or whether that's through whatever you can give, volunteer hours, um, whatever it is that you may have, um, those types of things. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, I've seen some very confusing videos online posted now by a former Facebook friend, and we'll never be that uh, friends with them again, of black males saying there's no racism. Why are they doing that? Is there a name for this type of behavior that seems to be denying racism exists um, against this, the people of the same race? Um, yeah, I, we talked a bit about it, but. So this type of um, racism is really similar to lateral violence. Mm -hmm. It does um, have its own sort of name to it, which I'm blanking on at the moment, um, but it, it is lateral violence. And what it is, is it's part of the process of colonization, which has happened. Um, all, um, everyone has been colonized um, and that includes the black community. Um, and so that belief system around trying to identify with the colonizer and become that white person um, is part of what fuels that and what that's about. It's about trying to, and it's part of the stages of what happens um, as a colonized individual. Um, there's a, who, Albert Memmi, mm -hmm. um, okay. Albert Memmi, a book called the, the Colonizer and the Colonized actually goes through this and explains this process that people experience. And one of the stages that people experience is an attempt to be like the um, oppressor and to identify and be identified with the oppressor, which means oppressing others or identifying that there's no racism that exists. Um, and so that's part of that system that happens. But I'd encourage people to read that book. It is a bit of a heavy read. Um, it's a small book, but it's, it's, it's a bit of a heavy read, but it is worth it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so how can white folks better acknowledge, support, um, righteous anger, grief, trauma of black, indigenous, and people of color who, with, sorry, without centering ourselves or our guilt? Um, I think one of the pieces is also acknowledging what happened um, and then asking what can I do for you as an individual? What can I do for you as a community? And then you as a white person, how can you turn your privilege into a space where you're supporting those people um, in a tangible manner? So it can also be um, by you acknowledging first, you're, you're not dismissing the pain, you're not dismissing their anger, you're not dismissing the trauma that they're experiencing. And then the next step, taking, asking them for what they need, how you can do better or help them, is giving them permission to tell you exactly what they need. And then the third is you taking further action on your own and acting on some of those calls to action that we gave you as an example. Do you have anything to add? Uh, no, that's really much inclusive of it. Also, I mean, again, the being the ally training will go further into this and what this is gonna look like, um, but also look at your own biases, examine your own belief systems, be aware that it's there, be aware that that, and it's okay that we have that knee gut and that, I mean, it's not okay we have that guilt, but it's okay that that guilt is there, we can't erase it. Um, but acknowledging that that's there and our, where our actions are coming from. Thank you. 
Um, and then the last question we have is, um, can you make this, pres this presentation outside of Winnipeg? Um, so as you saw from the poll, um, anybody was welcome around the world to attend. <laughs> um, but I think what will happen from these, um, these type of trainings and us kind of doing some more community consultations on this is that we will develop more um, trainings and tailoring them to the audiences. So um, stay tuned uh, for um, those type of trainings to come in the future. Like we at Immigration Partners of Winnipeg work with other local immigration partnerships across the province. Um, and this is a, an area of interest. And so we'll be um, adding more typical, these type of trainings um, with them as well. Mm -hmm. and so um, does anybody, if any, nobody else has any questions, we can wrap up. Um, yeah, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll say a quick thank you and, and give the last word to Elma, but just thank you. So, um, thank you so much um, to everybody who attended and stayed on during this uh, question period, I guess we'll call it. We really appreciate you taking the time um, to listen. And I, I do want to end this on thanking the Elmwood team for being so fantastic and, and doing an amazing and informative job with this um, training. Thank you. Yeah, I want to acknowledge um, Jessica, thank you for taking the time to answer all the 300 and plus emails that you've received just for this training. Um, but also for Becky for coming last minute to, to help us out with the uh, technology behind it. Um, I always say I'm still old school. I don't know anything about technology. <laughs> But uh, I really appreciate having um, Jessica and, and uh, Becky here with, with us. Um, but I also want to do a huge applaud to the team of ECRC, Lauren and Tamika. Um, this was not part of their job. So we all did it as the side work on our, in addition to the big plate that we have. Um, so want to really applaud and thank you for putting the work into this. Um, and I look forward to the 25th, June 25th, for more training. But also, um, people who are asking for more training, please send it to Jessica or myself, and we'll, we'll coordinate and see what we can do. I can't promise, but we will coordinate and see what we can do. And thank you all for being open to hear this, this conversation. I think it's up on all of us to have this uncomfortableness and difficult conversation in order for change to happen. Um, but at the same time, I believe, uh, I always say it takes a village to raise a child as per African proverb. So it takes all of us because racism has started before, before, before a long time ago, and it will continue until we make a stop to it. But until all of us are working together to find solution, but I'll leave to Lauren and Tamika to do their last words. Thank you. Um, thank you for listening, everyone, and having an open mind, and I hope to see you in the next training. Yeah, I just want to, you know, ditto. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for taking the time out and being passionate about wanting to see this change and wanting this to happen, and the fact that you even took the time to take this training means that something's moving, which is amazing to see. Um, and yeah, I look forward to seeing hopefully all of y'all at the training on the 25th with yours truly and Tamika and Jessica. Um, hopefully that'll be great. Awesome. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great night.